So the survival event featuring Tan is just around the corner and I thought I would have a look at my choices and recommendations for the event based on what I can surmise about how it will run, I suppose. And I'll be assuming that aside from the new enemy type that you'll be facing in this event, it will be much the same as the previous two incarnations of survival. And before I ramble on, I think I'm just going to get straight into my top recommended character for this event, and that is going to be this lady here, who I've only just unlocked, but I will be madly uh, upgrading her, hopefully to gold one in time for the event. That's just how good she is. Um, I would prefer to get her higher than that, but as it stands, that's as far as I'm going to get her in the time available. But if you do have her, um, if you do have her, then feel free to upgrade her as much as you wish. Uh, I think I will stick to what I said last time in terms of my rationale for approaching this event, where I will happily upgrade any characters that I think are worth upgrading for it, but not ones that I don't think have much use elsewhere. But Isabella, she's going to be good for this event, and she's great in pretty much all other areas of the game except for raids so definitely one to put as much resources into as you want guilt free I think she'll do you well and it's more than simply her being a healer and being able to heal people next to her that is going to make her good for this event in as far as I can tell now in the most recent uh, patch notes it was mentioned that revives. Um, so if you resurrect a character through her active ability, you can end up with six characters on the map if you're playing a mode where you get reinforcements. So that's in Onslaught or Survival, which is of course the subject of this video. And the update said that now you will no longer be offered reinforcements if, you're, if you have six characters on the screen and one of them dies. So if you're on six characters, one dies, you'll just go down to five. You won't be offered any reinforcements. You'll only be offered reinforcements if you dip below five total characters on the map. Which is, I guess, their way of trying to limit you from having lots and lots of characters on the map in a mode where you have active refreshes. So you can refresh Isabella's active potentially without this, and... Just keep getting more and more characters on the uh, map as you get more reinforcements and more of them die. But I think there is a way around this. I'm not sure if this is intentional or not, but to me it seems quite obvious. Um, so say so you have five characters on the map. And uh, you get one of your fleshy characters ki killed, because she can only re uh, resurrect fleshy characters. So you get them killed, you get a new reinforcement coming, and then you're back up to five characters, and you don't use her active. Now you get the new reinforcement, you get them killed as well, as, as long as they're fleshy. And then you get your reinforcement, and then you get that reinforcement killed. And now you have three characters, fleshy characters, who have died on your team. And there's nothing about Isabella to, Isabella's ability which suggests that she can't... Up, um, resurrect free dead characters if it's getting refreshed. So you have free characters die, you get them replaced by free reinforcements, so you have five characters on the map and three sort of dead floating in the ether ready to potentially be resurrected. So you use Isabella's active, you resurrect one of the dead characters, you pick up the active refresh, and then if what I think will happen happens, You'll then use it again, and you'll re resurrect the second of the three dead characters, at which point you'll have seven characters on the map. And then if you refresh her ability again, of course you will get your eighth character on the map. And, like I said, the patch, it's, they seem to have foreseen something like this happening and tried to stall it, but there's nothing that suggests to me that you couldn't do what I've just said and get eight characters on the map. And of course, in a mode like this, where you need to be clearing out enemies as quickly as possible, having eight characters on the map is going to be a great boon to you. 
because it means you're not really stretching yourself trying to run all over the map with limited selection of characters trying to kill everything in time. And it does mean that healing your characters might be a little more difficult, but of course if you have Isabella with her automatic healing via her passive, if you keep everyone kind of clustered around her, you can afford to keep a bunch of characters clustered around her and still have enough characters to easily kind of kill everything on the map. So I think to go alongside her, what would be good would be to have good ranged characters. So well, anyone with a ranged attack to take advantage of um, turtling and still being able to hit any enemies that come sort of relatively close to you. So that might include um, characters like Thaddeus or Vindicta or uh, Yarrick as well. I think they will be fairly decent characters just in terms of having a ranged attack and also not being the worst characters possible to use. I'm not particularly sold on Thaddeus and Yarrick being very good, but in terms of the options that are available, they're still not bad choices. And seeing as you might be able to have a bunch of characters, far more than intended, running around on the map, then this might, yeah, I don't think you could go too far wrong with having them around. Um, now, there is slight issue of the, well, it doesn't really matter how many characters you have on the field. If, say, all your characters are capped out at Silver 1, uh, the moment you get sort of high up into the epic levels or into the legendary stages, you could have 20 Silver 1 characters on the map. It doesn't matter, they're all going to get killed in one or two hits. So there is a sort of logical limit to how useful this can be. But as long as your characters are sort of at or near the current level cap uh, that, uh, that's allowed by the um, rarity you're playing at, then I think this will do you really well. So for someone like me who has quite a few um, gold ones, this will do me all the way through at least up until the end of the epic stages. And then even into the epic, um, into the legendary stage, the first wave, if it's anything like the previous survival, it should be relatively easy. And the going will only get tough sort of once you're into wave 12 or 13 or so. And that's hopefully will be more than enough to get the um, legendary books, at least as far as I'm concerned. If you're the kind of person who has a strong enough roster to um, have a bunch of diamond free characters, then this could do you really good having a whole bunch of diamond frees in the legendary levels. That will probably help you to really keep the numbers of enemies down and really set you up well for the final wave, if you're able to get that far. And well, just thinking about the final wave, I imagine it will consist of a whole lot of Ophidian destroyers, seeing as you're facing the Necrons as a faction, and that's sort of the um, end end tier mob unit that really can put a lot of hurt on your characters. And having that many characters on the field, if you have summoning abilities available to them as well, I think you could really clog up the map and potentially give yourself enough time to take out at least one or two of them. And that will do you really well on the leaderboard if you're able to do that. Because I think that will be the problem that people will face is that even if you have really strong characters, if you're only able to have five of them on the battlefield at once and you don't have a huge amount of summons, if a whole, if say a dozen Ophidian destroyers get spawned in, as seems to be the um, case in the final waves, uh, we've seen in the last two survival events, uh, the first one there are a dozen Tyranid warriors spawned in the final wave, and then in the second one, same again, a dozen Tyranid warriors, so a dozen Ophidian destroyers have really pumped up stats. It doesn't matter how good your characters are, they're going to get overwhelmed by them very quickly. And as was seen in the uh, Chaos survival, what you really need is, well, what really helped people to get high scores was having lots and lots of pox walkers on the field to soak up all of those high damaging hits from the really tough enemies at the end to give you enough time with whatever character you've put all of your buffs onto to really lay waste to as many of those tough Tyranid warriors as possible before they um, are on their own on the map and kind of get singled out and killed. So that is a really big advantage I can see of this is just with the characters you have available, there aren't great ways of um, flooding the battlefield with summons. 
not like you can with Corodius, so this will probably be the next best thing. And of course, if you are going down that route at the end, then you'll want good summoners, so that would include having a Creed, a Yarrick, of course Tan being the event character, he'll be able to summon up to five Skitari, so that's good. Um, and uh, Bellator, of course, is able to summon his Inceptors, there might be someone I'm forgetting, but those are the one, main ones that sort of stick out in my head at the moment. So that's definitely the way I can see that people will probably... Again, if it's this whole Isabella trick thing that I've got playing over in my mind works, that's the way I can see people of um, getting proper high scores here. I don't think I'll be able to get a high score in that way, but if you can do that and uh, it works, then you may be doing quite well in this event, I think. So... I'm bringing Isabella for that reason, and then who else am I going to be taking? Well, of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention Tan, because uh, he's the event character, and he's, as he's the event character, you can get him his stats boosted by up to 140% in terms of his health and damage, so you definitely want to be keeping him around into the end game, and Tan despite being a brilliant character on his own, I think he's probably the best character in the game. That's, in my opinion, he is. He's still very much diminished without Actus uh, to help him along. The, the ability to spawn two Skitari every round is just immensely useful. And, of course, the uh, level of the Skitari is not dependent in any way on the level of Actus. So even if you have a gold one Actus healing a diamond free tan, once you've gotten to the legendary waves, it doesn't matter that it's only a gold one Actus healing tan, you'll still get maximum level Skitari spawned. So it's just a good reason to keep Actus around and alive if you have him. So I think those two will definitely be have to be a mainstay of your team. If you don't have Actus, tan is still good on his own, but you will have to... I think focus more around obviously having a fleshy team because the only other mechanical healer you have is Vitruvius and <laughs> if you don't have Actus you probably don't have Vitruvius either or if you do you probably don't have him upgraded and I wouldn't recommend upgrading him because he he has his niche uses but he's really not a great character. And finally to round out the Adeptus Mechanicus I'm thinking of taking in Ro, although I am a bit worried, and the reason for uh, worried about doing that, the reason for that is, as I've learned from Guild Wars, when he isn't sort of over-leveled relative to his enemies, he doesn't really perform very impressively, uh, and he's not the strongest character, so I'm thinking if I'm not careful I might end up getting him killed early, which means I then won't be able to take advantage of his diamond free stats once I get into the legendary waves. So anyone else with a well-developed admech team for raids? Yeah, I think that's just a little precaution you might want to take, maybe not having a row as one of your starting characters could possibly be a good idea. And then again you won't want to miss out on being able to have him at all, in just in case you get unlucky with the reinforcements. And if you're pulling the Isabella trick, obviously that's going to burn through a lot of your reinforcement tokens, so you won't have potentially a lot of opportunity to actually get Row spawned in at the sort of end game when you're losing a lot of characters if you don't have a lot of um, spawn tokens left, because you've pulled a bunch of shenanigans to stop uh, to stack the deck in your favour, I guess. So all in all, I think I will get row in early and I won't be too I'll start with row on my team and I won't be too uh, ballsy with him I won't put him in too dangerous situations and I'll just try and get that Isabella thing going as quickly as possible to start stacking the deck in my favor with having the extra characters um, because I think row on on his well, he's not going to be on his own because he'll be with his uh, with Tan and Actus, but he's not the best for quickly getting through lots of enemies. 
depending on their positioning. If you get lucky with positioning, he can sort of chop through crowds quite handily, but even so, I'd much rather prefer um, depend on someone like Vindicta to clear out lots of enemies quickly, or um, Bellator on his summons as well, potentially. And speaking of which, I am recommending uh, Vindicta and Bellator. Actually, I'll just have a look at the um, in, uh, individual factions. So, I've already been over the ad mech. I think made it clear that they're going to be good here, especially if you have them built. Row, not so much of an issue if you don't have them built. I wouldn't worry too much about it, but definitely Tan and Axis so you're going to want to have hanging around. A Sororitas, um... Morven Val, uh, I'm not too keen on her. She doesn't scale particularly well in terms of her stats, and because um, she will be capped at whatever um, rarity you're playing at, she won't have the advantage of being a natural legendary that you get when you're using her sort of outside of um, events that are rarity capped. So her stats I think will be very unimpressive uh, from what I saw in Faction Wars as well it seemed to be that way when people were using her she just didn't seem to really do any damage at all and uh, she's quite a rare character anyway so the chances are you probably won't even have her because well, it doesn't really matter I'm not going to ramble about her because I'm just going to say I don't think she's very good same for Roswitha, she's obviously anti-Psyker in a battle where you're not going to be facing any psychers, her active isn't particularly good good for a horde-based battle. So I think she's a definite no. She's not particularly tanky or anything either, so nothing really going for her. In terms of Celestine, she's good in shorter uh, form content, so tournament arena, normal arena, those Gemini can be really annoying. Uh, to try and deal with, just to break through them to get to her and kill her. However, in a horde mode, when they, they're going to get popped out and start running around the map, you're very quickly going to lose their protection on Celestine. Also, because they get spawned the moment she takes any damage, they'll spawn at whatever rarity uh, you're playing at when she takes damage. And due to the nature of this mode, you're either going to have to hang Celestine right back from the fighting to stop her from taking damage early to stop the Gemini spawning at a very low rarity because once summons are spawned their rarity will not increase as the rarity cap goes up so if they get spawned at the common rarity they'll keep their common stats when you go into uncommon and they'll very quickly die and that will be the end of um, Celestine's passive providing any use so to avoid that you could keep her back from the fighting but then she's useless or you can put her in the fighting, you can lose her Gemini, and then without her Gemini, her stats are actually pretty poor. And if you're going to be using um, Isabella and also Vindicta, who I'll be recommending, then her act of faith isn't going to be of a great deal of use either, because it'll probably be being triggered by Vindicta at least quite a lot. But ultimately, I don't think Celestine is a good pick here, especially if her um, Gemini remain at the stats they had when they were uh, when they were spawned uh, if they're revived so if you wait until an epic stage to start um, resurrecting things with Isabella's active and the Gemini died when they're at common rarity I have a suspicion that when they get uh, revived they will have their same stats they did when they were at common rarity and they will just very quickly be killed again so I don't think they're going to be very much use I don't think Celestine is going to be very much use but Isabella, I've already spoken about, I think she's going to be great, and finally you've got uh, Vindicta, and Vindicta is always a reliable character. She's quite frail, so but you have Isabella to keep her topped up on health, and I think she makes up for that frailty in her ability to kill group clustered groups of enemies, so that will really kind of stop them before they can do anything too bad to her, hopefully, and it will stop your characters from being overwhelmed, especially again if you're trying to outnumber the enemy with the method I've described. So a good one to have hanging around I think. Aside from that you have the Astra Militarum and I'm not too keen on these guys but if you're doing the Isabella thing I said about, Creed and Yarrick, 
I think at the end game could come in really handy to just give you a few meat shields against the um, Ophidian destroyers that will come in at the end. That will take quite a good bit of setup, and obviously I can't do that, but if you happen to have them unlocked and at high level, then that could be a really good choice. Thaddeus, I wasn't too keen on him when I first started thinking about this event, but he'll be good for getting rid of Scarab Swarms, of course, because of his um, blast damage, and if you have lots of characters running around on the map, as well as Skitari, I don't think you'll have to be too worried about how frail he is. And... Quite often in survival I've had sort of uh, pants soiling moments where I've realised that there's one enemy left on the field that I can't reach with anyone, and the rarity cap of the enemies is about to increase, but I need to kill that last enemy to increase the rarity cap, and I'm just kind of going, oh god, a bunch of my characters might die in the next round because I can't reach this final enemy to kill them. Well, Thaddeus, his active, can obviously hit from any range, so if you keep that sort of as a as an insurance policy, that could come in handy. Just the fact that he's able to run free spaces and he has a range of free as well means that he can very easily, even if he's if you leave him in the middle of the map, he can probably run and reach out to the furthest corners of the map if you need him to, to kill any enemies that might be sort of hiding too far away for anyone else to reach. So Thaddeus is kind of a uh, an insurance policy, I think is a good idea. And then otherwise to have him hanging around Isabella and just sniping uh, any enemies that make them make a nuisance of themselves. He does enough damage, I think, to hopefully deal with Ophidian destroyers as well, which will probably be something that will be quite an issue during the course of an event, of the event. So someone to think about keeping around, I think. Definitely for Thaddeus. And finally you've got the dreaded Ultramarines. And... <laughs> Incisus, I guess if you don't have Isabella and you don't have Actus, then you will always at least have Incisus as a healer. And you'll be wanting to base your team on fleshy characters. So him being the only healer you have, you kind of you're gonna be forced to use him. And honestly, even though you know, he he's seen a lot more acceptance in recent times, uh even though he's, he's historically been seen as a bad unit and his healing isn't great and his passive is just awful because it never works, even though it's supposed to work 90% of the time. The chances are someone next to him gets overkilled, or even if they don't get overkilled, he'll still fail to revive them. He's just... he's not great, but a healer's a healer. He'll do you good, at least until the legendary wave, if you have him at gold one. And I think he'd definitely be good to have around in that situation. Or at least... And I wouldn't recommend against pumping resources into him to level him up for the sake of this event, because he's good in Guild Wars and LREs as well. So not a bad character, just outclassed, I think, very much in this case by Isabella. So Isabella, if you have her, should be your priority. Aside from that, in the Ultramarines, Certus and Varro are obvious no's. Certus just... He's a poor character in general. He, granted, he does do quite a bit of damage, but his passive ability is basically useless. His active ability is very underwhelming. Um, in general, he there is no point in investing anything into him. I have him at Iron 2. I've beaten the whole of the Indomitus Elite campaign. Got 120 medals on that, and he's at Iron 2. So, theoretically, you don't ever really have to put any resources into Certus, and I certainly wouldn't, unless I absolutely had to. And the same goes for Varro, really. There, there is, outside of his campaign, there's really nothing useful for him to do in the game. He's just, at this point, completely outclassed, unless you want to do some kind of psychic resistance type team using his passive. I guess I have been stymied somewhat in Guild Wars by Varro and his passive before especially in combination with Isabella's healing, but again, would I recommend building a character solely for Guild Wars? Not especially. And his damage just is, due to his high pierce, is just quite unimpressive. So don't expect him to be clearing through waves of enemies particularly quickly. His active, okay, can hit a few enemies, but that's only once it's sort of reached high levels. If you use it early on in the survival, it's only going to chain up to 
maybe four enemies in total. So even then, it's not that it's not particularly great, and just he in my eyes is not worth the effort. The absence of Bush, um, Brother Birchard in this event, as opposed to the first one, I think will be quite keenly felt because he is a great character, but you still do have two characters with Gravis armor. And Gravis armor, of course, is always very important for just the amount of... Uh, it reduces the attrition that your characters take. Granted, most people, I guess, won't have Kalgar, uh, but Bellator, I don't think you can really go wrong with him. His summons, they're fairly tough, uh, and the Necrons themselves, aside from the Ophidian Destroyers and their death marks, if they score a critical hit, they don't deal a huge amount of damage. The Flayed Ones, they do physical damage, so as long as your armor stat exceeds their damage, they're basically going to be doing nothing to your characters or summons. And the Necron, Necron Warriors just have a very low base damage. So even if the rarity cap of the enemy increases, if you have Inceptors on the field, their rarity cap won't increase, but I think they'll still have some staying power just because of how weak the Necron's attacks are in general. The only things that will really give them trouble will be Death Marks and Ophidian Destroyers. So I don't see anything bad about having a lot of Inceptors around, even if they do get outclassed ultimately. They are extremely good at taking out Scarab Swarms before they can start multiplying en masse and really making a nuisance of themselves. And Bellator himself, because of his passive, he is able to kill a lot of enemies per turn just with the sheer amount of num sheer number of Inceptors he can summon in, as well as making them fire again potentially with his passive ability, and also buffing the damage that they do which can help punch through the armour of tougher things like, say, the Ophidian Destroyers. And speaking of punching through armour, if you do have Man Manius Kalgar, he's, I think, pretty much a no-brain pick here, um, just due to the fact that his passive provides so much damage to surrounding characters and summons, especially if you're going to be spawning in lots of Skitari with Tan, because the Skitari, although they do have decent defensive stats, they, they tank quite well for summons, their damage output really is abysmal, but they do deal free hits, so if they're standing next to Kalgar when they fire, they will get his damage bonus that he provides via his passive three times per attack. So they can actually do quite a sizable level of damage at 70% pierce ratio, which is a very high good pierce ratio, if they're next to Kalgar. That's a way to really increase the deadliness of the Skitari that you will inevitably be spawning in this event because you'll be wanting to keep your Tan around for his boosted stats and the fact that you get him for di at Diamond Free for free in the Legendary stage. So, yep, Kalgar, if you have him, I think no brainer. Of course, his active is also excellent if in, in a pinch to clear out a bunch of enemies. So, Nothing wrong with Kalgar either. Just <laughs> making sure this is still recording. It would be annoying if uh, the recorder stopped and I kept rambling for another hour, like I tend to do. But that is me. I think I've gone through basically everyone now. Uh, of course, I forgot Titus. Um, yeah, Titus. Cool, whatever. Now, he, I, I think he gets a bad rap. I think his um, passive ability is quite good, but... I don't know much about him, I haven't used him a great deal aside from in the survival event, obviously, and he had boosted stats then. So I can't, I don't really have a really accurate picture of how he will perform when he doesn't have that boost to him, but as far as I've heard, he's not great, so I hesitantly say to stay away from him, just based on feedback from others. Not that I particularly trust other people's opinions a great deal in this game, but there you go. And now there's the question of who to put the power-ups on, and I think in this case I've recommended so many units, um, so many characters to use because, again, if this Isabella thing works, then you're going to have a whole lot of characters running around the field, and you don't really want to... I feel like... If you have a strong character, it's best just to get as many power-ups on them as it, as possible. And I feel like in this event, 
Tan is going to be the... He is the main character of the event, and he will also be the one that you want to get the power-ups on. Just because, obviously, he gets that native boost to his damage as you complete the survival missions, uh, boosting his stats by 140% at maximum. And he's also just a generally quite a good character at killing things, especially with his 70% pierce ratio um, ranged attack. Because at, when the um, Ophidian dis destroyers spawn in in the final wave, as I'm sure they will, I don't think anyone's going to be able to stand up to them for any great period of time, because they uh, deal 80% pierce. So even Gravis armor, compared to characters without Gravis armor, they'll still be taking 80% of the damage that a character with without Gravis armor will be taking. So Gravis armor is not going to save Kalgar and Bellator particularly. It's not going to save anyone. The Ophidian Destroyers will not be denied. They do a hell of a lot of damage, and again, as I said at the start, I think the only thing that will really slow them down is just clogging the map with as many summons as possible. Of course, Tan is able, as long as Actus is still alive, can produce two summons per turn. So if you have an initial wave of Destroyers and they start attacking your stuff, kill a few Skitari, say, well, you can spawn a couple more Skitari in with Tan, whilst you're attacking the destroyers, just to give by yourself a little more time, potentially. And in Tan himself, you'll be doing a lot of damage if you pick up the extra hits damage, um, the extra hits power-ups, because he's balanced around doing a low number of hits. His damage stat is actually quite high, so picking up um, the extra melee hits, the extra, or the two extra hits, which applies to both his ranged and melee attack, that will actually make him into quite a powerhouse in terms of just dealing raw damage. I think that will be enough for him to punch through even armor of sort of super boosted Ophidian destroyers that will likely be spawned in the final wave. And I think that alongside the massed summon strategy I have detailed will be your ticket to reaching the top of the leaderboard. I don't think I'll be able to do it, but if you have the troops available to you to do that, then... I think that's what I'd recommend. But yeah, I think just get all of the power-ups on Tan if you can, because the effect of them really snowballs. And um, the effect of, of them, effectiveness of them, kind of snowballs. You know, if you have a damage power-up on a character, but they don't have the health or the armor power-ups, then suddenly they die quickly, and they haven't really been able to put that damage to good use. So you need someone who can survive long enough to make use of the extra hits and damage. And I think Tan in general is just a good candidate for them. Because of the reasons I said of him already doing high damage of low hits, so he benefits a lot from the extra hits. And if you boost his damage further, I think he could really do deal quite a lot of pain to those super tough Ophidian destroyers. Especially with his high pierce ratio. So hopefully he won't have to worry about their armour. He'll be able to just punch through it and kill them regardless. Or if you have high ground, I think his melee attacks, if you have the damage power up on him, if you manage to get it, that alongside the 140% damage boost and the extra hits, I'm hoping, despite its mere 1% pierce ratio, should be enough to just overpower uh, their armor stats and kill them regardless. So, yeah, I'm not going to ramble on about power ups as much as I did last time, because I think I learned the lesson on the last survival where... You really just want to concentrate your power-ups onto one character and not worry too much about things. As far as my healers go, I'm not concerned about boosting their damage stats because they're not good enough to really survive into the later waves of the battle anyway. And when you get into the later waves, it's more about delaying the tough, super tough enemies with lots of um, meat shields and trying to kill them as quickly as possible. So healing doesn't really come into things anyway. So... I'm not... Healers are good as to get you through the early parts of the event, I feel, but once you get to the legendary stages, especially the tougher ones, healing kind of goes out the window, and it's just a case of kill, kill, kill. And you don't want to have your um, any stat boosts, any power-ups on your healers, because at that point they're not actually going to be very useful. I guess one final thing I'll add is you could potentially do sort of some sort of thing where you keep Vindicta held back, sort of out of the way. Um, 
let her build up acts of faith because you've got a lot of Imperial allies dying and killing enemies. And maybe in the final wave, when all those Ophidian destroyers will spawn, if you if you have her sort of uh, tucked away safely, you might be able to hit a bunch of them with her sort of attack power being boosted massively by Act of Faith if you have a good crit item on her, and maybe wipe out a bunch of them in one hit. Depending on how high their stats are, that might not be possible, but it's just something to consider, maybe, if you have, you know, her crit damage being boosted by several hundred percent because you haven't killed anyone of a sister of battle through the whole of the survival um, battle, maybe that could be something you could do as well. But yeah, I think that is all I have to say on this for now, so I will cease my yapping.